morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. For those of you that were here for our children's story, I promise uh, we know our Bibles here. Um, and uh, the, the youth would be able to tell that story, but uh, we have, uh, if you haven't met Moises, uh, he knows how to put a good spin on it. So thank you, Moises, for that children's story. But just in case you were worried, I just wanted to cover that base. Um, well, good morning. It's, it's uh, exciting to be here. Thank you for being here, not only for, for church, to worship together, but also to be here for um, what is Mother's Day weekend. And we're excited. Uh, if you are a mother and you didn't get a, a, a flower, there's one left. So uh, we'll have a Coliseum-style fight to, the, to get the rose at the end here if, if you didn't get one. Um, but uh, we are also here today to celebrate uh, the youth and the young adults uh, for this Sabbath. So we're not only celebrating our mothers, but we're celebrating um, the product of all their hard work and their the devotion um, and their willingness to, to raise um, children of God. Amen? Now, for our discussion this morning, um, we're going to be looking at a question. And that question is something I actually want to begin with, because sometimes when we are preparing sermons, we will work up towards something, and we kind of build our way up towards understanding as we go through a story or a certain passage of scripture or a certain topic. And we will be doing some of that today, but I want to begin by asking the question so that you, uh, we all, can ask this question together as we are reflecting on it and as we go through the, the discussion and the message today. So that question that I have for everybody this morning is, what is Christ-centered living and what is it all about? What does a life with Jesus at the center of it look like? You may have sung the song before, Jesus at the center of it all, and maybe you know the, the verses where you sing Jesus at the center of it all, you sing Jesus at the center of my life, Jesus at the center of our church, Jesus at the center of our school, and you just want Jesus to be at the center of everything. And it's a beautiful song, and chances are if you're here this morning on a Sabbath morning, you, you believe that and you want that for yourself. As Christians, Christ followers, we are people seeking to become more like Christ, to be disciples of Christ, to be the people of Christ, and we all want Jesus to be the center of our lives. It's a beautiful, a beautiful idea, a beautiful focus, but what does it actually look like in practice? And so that's what we're going to be asking this morning, and I'm proposing to you all this morning that many, if not most, of our arguments our controversies, our divisions in church come from a disagreement on what Christ-centered living really looks like. So this morning, as we reflect on this question, we're going to seek both to maybe define the term a little bit, to define the term a little bit, and we're also going to see if we can't figure it out what it is we're talking about and uh, come together on what it is we're talking about when we're saying we want to live christ centered lives. First of all, I want you all to picture with me for a moment our solar system. Our solar system, uh, this is a picture, if you are a flat earther, I'm sorry you may struggle with this analogy a little bit, but bear with me. The sun is at the center. I know everything's blue, it's hard to tell, but if you can imagine it, the sun's at the center, and the planets are circling and orbiting around it. This analogy won't apply to much more than just picturing something for us this morning, but I do think that this is often how we view our lives when we think about Jesus being at the center. The planets are everything in our lives, the different worlds, if you will, that we have going on, our, our families, our friends, our school, our work, our activities, the things we care about, they're all orbiting around us. And we, we see in our mind's eye when we picture a Christ-centered life, Jesus is being the sun. Jesus is being the center of it all. And if this uh, was how a Christ-centered life looked like, and Jesus was at the center of your life, 
the thing that's a little bit difficult about this analogy is that your life wouldn't just be moving in circles around and around. You would want to be moving towards the sun, right? You would want to be moving closer to Jesus and who he is. You wouldn't just be statically moving around. But I think where this analogy really breaks down is when you realize that if Jesus is at the center of your life, he can't be like this because the sun is completely disconnected from everything else that's happening in life. If the solar system were maybe a ranking of priority and you had Jesus at the center and then the next ring was your family and your next ring was your work and your next ring was your church or whatever it looked like for you, those things would still be separate from Jesus even if Jesus was the number one priority in your life. So while this may be something like the first thing we think about when we say we want to place Jesus at the center of our life, I want to challenge this picture a little bit this morning. Because if the center of your life is about what is a priority in your life, then the things that aren't as much a priority in your life or that you don't rank as highly Maybe it is your friends that are further out. Maybe it is your family that's further out. Maybe it is your church, your work, whatever, your social life that's further out. It wouldn't be close enough to Jesus to really be affected that much, right? Be an ice planet out on the brink of your solar system of your life. For this reason, I think when we're talking about Jesus at the center of our life, we need to get a sense of direction. We need a sense of direction, and I'm not just talking generally about having a general sense of direction. I'm talking literally about having a sense of direction of how we're moving to or from Jesus if he's the center of our lives. Because if you're thinking about our lives in an abstract way with Jesus at the center, are you picturing yourself facing towards Jesus, moving towards him, or are you facing yourself moving outward from him? And don't be too quick to say facing towards him, because obviously it sounds better to be moving towards Jesus, to be facing towards him. And I'm not saying uh, that that's wrong, but for the sake of this analogy, I know it sounds wrong to say facing away from Jesus, but bear with me. What if there is a difference between a life centered towards Christ, trying to work towards him, compared to a life with Jesus at the center And all you do comes outward from him. You see, part of the problem, I think, with how we talk about Christ-centered living is we disconnect Jesus from us and from our lives. We see Jesus as the sun, as this distant planet, and we place him as something separate from our other planets and our other worlds that are orbiting around us. He becomes simply an entity, a destination for us to work towards and to be drawing closer to. And I'm not sure that that's really what placing Jesus at the center of our lives is all about. Let's consider for a moment a very prominent issue, especially since uh, 2020, that's been facing not only church leadership, um, both pastors and volunteers, but also been facing even church members or church attendees. That issue is burnout. Burnout, it's almost a trigger word now because it's something that we all experience, we all think about, and when it comes to church and faith, it's almost that much more so. Everyone from church leadership to church attendees can experience burnout. And often when people burn out in ministry uh, or in their faith, it's because they feel like they're working and working and working and they're tired of working and working and working. Whether you're preaching up front, whether you're doing AV in the back, whether you're helping with potluck, or whether you're just coming and taking time out of your Sabbath morning to wake up, get dressed, and to come sit in the pews, it can feel like you're giving and giving and working and working. And while maybe you started giving of your time and your energy from a place of genuine gratitude and worship and thankfulness and excitement, Over time, it started to feel like you were giving from a place of what was required of you, what was expected of you. 
what was expected of you by yourself, expected of you by others, or even expected of you by God. It is exhausting to do what is expected of you when you're constantly working towards an unachievable goal. We are always striving to move towards Jesus, but we know that we're not perfect and that we'll never reach that goal. What if the story of Pilgrim's Progress was this way? If you don't know the story of Pilgrim's Progress, it's a a story about a man named Christian, uh, and he goes on a journey through his life, through his Christian faith, and he is carrying a heavy load. And that load is the burden of his sin and shame. The journey he goes on is an allegory for life and faith, and the end destination that he eventually reaches is heaven. Now, if you know the story, you know that Christian doesn't make the whole journey carrying his heavy load. He gets to the foot of the cross, his burden rolls off, and he is freed from his burden, and he isn't expected to carry it any farther. We may know this story, we may preach about grace and forgiveness, but yet we don't actually live our Christian lives this way. We don't do this. We act like Sisyphus, the Greek legend who is forced to roll a boulder up a hill for eternity just to always inevitably have it roll back down on top of him. When we believe in Christ-centered living, it is easy for us to view it like this, a pointless effort. Maybe not pointless as in not ungood, if you could say that. It's good to work towards reaching Christ. But we feel and we know in our hearts we will never be perfect. We'll never actually draw close enough to Jesus. We'll just inevitably be rolling this boulder up this hill for eternity. We start to believe that we must do the work ourselves to bring ourselves even closer to Christ, though we know we'll never truly reach him. But I don't believe that this is the truth. I believe that this is a misconception of direction. I believe that the gospel says something different about the direction, the sense of direction that we all need to have. I think the gospel is about a different direction, a different focus of life while still having Christ at the center. And while you still think about that, I want to talk about how this feeling of pointlessness can also be applied to theology or the study of God. Um, You can get lost studying God. Did you realize that? You can get lost in your own study. Um, This was something I struggled with as a theology major in in college, which was what what my major was. And so I would go to classes, and we would be talking about wonderful things, but it would get frustrating sometimes. Because sometimes when you're talking about the nature of sin, um, how the world came to be, the, the details of communion and, and baptism, maybe even small things like church etiquette. Sometimes you get into these conversations and you think to yourself for a moment, wait a minute, God is unknowable. And most of us here this morning would probably agree or believe that Jesus or God is too big for us mere mortals to understand, to comprehend, to fully know. And yet, theology is the study of knowing God, studying God. And so sometimes it feels pointless. And this is even some of what we're doing here this morning. We're doing practicing theology. It's what we do at church. We study the scriptures. We study Jesus to get a better picture of who God is and what's expected from us. We want to study God. It's a beautiful pursuit. But if you lose the big picture, it's easy to get lost in the details. And this is such a danger for Adventists because we sit on a gold mine of truth, of understanding. We have an understanding of knowledge about prophecy, about end times, about understanding the scriptures. Yet is it possible to get so wrapped up in knowing or studying the details of truth that you haven't been refreshed by the gospel and the character of who Jesus is in a while? 
the good news and the grace of Christ. I want to propose this morning that it may be possible that the solution to both burnout and issues, controversies, arguments of belief, doctrine, and denomination is for us to be living truly Christ-centered lives. Well, let's step away from the analogies for just a moment, and I want to take a look at some of what the Bible actually has to say on this topic. Let's begin with a passage that we've looked at together, if you were here with us back in the fall, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 4 through 5. Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I him in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This language of abiding, if, if you remember or you were here when we talked about uh, this chapter back in the fall, we talked about that word abiding or what it, what it really means and how Jesus says to abide is the number one priority that he has for his disciples, for the people who follow him, for his Christians, as they would come to be called. The number one focus, the number one priority is to abide, to be connected to him. Do you think that maybe this idea of abiding in Christ and Christ in you could maybe be helpful to begin to understand talking about Christ-centered living? Maybe. Let's look at another passage uh, and look at a verse found in the middle of a fascinating section on righteousness by faith. Let's look at Galatians 2, verse 20. Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is writing to the church of Galatia, and he's not just telling them, hey, I want you to do this certain thing, or I want you to act a certain way. This is also part of what Paul talks about later on in 1 Corinthians when he wants them to be imitators of him. He writes to the Corinthians and he says, I want you to be imitators of me. It's not from a place of arrogance. It's because he knows that all his actions are a reflection that Christ is living in him. Paul isn't being arrogant in his own righteousness, in his own acts. He's saying that all his actions, everything that he does, if you imitate it, you'll be reflecting Christ because it is actually Christ who is living in and abiding within him. And then finally for the passage this morning, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of life uh, is because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Part of what I love so much about the book of Romans, is that it is theological. Paul builds up an argument talking about faith and righteousness and grace and the role of Christ in our own salvation. He builds it up through Romans 1 all the way up to Romans 8, and he goes on afterwards. He builds up to Romans chapter 8, and we get that wonderful passage at the end of Romans chapter 8 talking about how nothing can separate us from, from God. Nothing can separate us from his love. But before he builds up to that specific argument, earlier in the chapter, he says this, and he writes this, and he says, I'm going to keep my focus on what we're talking about here. He says that it is the lack of separation from God that affects us in our lives and in our actions. It is the spirit of Christ dwelling in us 
that causes us to act a certain way, to behave a certain way, and to do life differently. You know, as Christians, we've all felt like failures in one way or another. You've, you've felt like maybe you've let God down. Maybe you felt like you've let your family down, let your church down. You failed to meet the expectations. You may have placed Jesus at the center or the focus of your life, and you tried to move your life towards him, but you failed to actually reach him. And I'm here to say this morning that if that's how we feel, if that's how you feel, then we are doing Christianity wrong. All of it. If you are placing Jesus on some distant shore and you're trying to wade through the water of life to reach him, you're inevitably going to burn out. You're going to drown and you are going to completely miss the point. Jesus didn't come to die for you so that you could climb mountains to get closer to him. Jesus didn't rise from the dead to show you that you needed to do everything on your own. Jesus came to create a way for you to abide with him. Jesus came to do life with you. And that's the answer to the question this morning. That's the answer to the question this morning. The question about what is Christ-centered living about? What is Christ-centered living? Christ-centered living is about bringing Jesus into the core of your life, living for him, and more importantly, also living with him. As Paul says, live your life for Christ, and your actions and the planets circling around your life will begin to reflect Jesus, his character, and his love. We need to bring Jesus into the core of who we are, not trying to use our own power, our own ability to somehow draw ever closer to Jesus without ever reaching him. The Bible says that Jesus is already willing to be, to dwell, to abide in you so that your life, your actions can reflect outwards from working from a place of Jesus, of Christ at your center. And as we think about this and consider this on a personal level, I want to ask, can this conversation of Christ-centeredness be applied on a church-wide scale? What does it look like when a church either places Jesus at the center and understands the, the direction of action, or if they fail to do so? Would it be possible for a church to merely be doing things for Christ, but not doing things with Christ? Christ. If you're involved in a church, a school, uh, or any spiritual organization or group, do you see that group working to please God, working to do things for God, or are they working from a place of relationship with God, not just following where he leads or where they think he's leading, but following and acting because of what he's already doing in their lives? I hope that our church here either is or will always be a place that always works outward from Jesus, a place that has Jesus at the center of our lives so that we can work outward from who he is. But every church and every organization is made up of individuals. So the call this morning is not for you to move mountains, to change structures politically, businessly, churchly. The call isn't for you to change the world right now. The call this morning is to look at the focus of your own heart. The call is to ask yourself this morning, is Jesus at the center of my life? Is Jesus truly at my core right now, today? Are you burnt out? Are you tired of giving and working and serving? Maybe it's time to truly reconnect, to refocus, and to be refreshed by Jesus and who he is. Are you feeling lost in your faith? Do you feel like you're getting caught up in arguments about the details of your systematic theology or the details of truth? While they may be good things and good discussions to have, 
is it may be time for you to step back, to refocus yourself, to recenter yourself, to place Jesus at the core of who you are, and to work outward from that relationship. I think it's too easy for us to be Christian and to put ourselves at the center of the solar system. Jesus just becomes a planet circling around us. He's one of the worlds that we think about. We are the sun, but there's family, there's friends, there's work, there's church, and then there's Jesus. Jesus is not meant to be just a planet in your solar system. Jesus wants to be more, and I believe Jesus should be more. Jesus should be the center of our lives. My prayer this morning is that all of us will put Jesus at the center of our lives. May we all live truly Christ-centered lives. And let's see how God works and heals relationships, heals attitudes, heals and sends us in proper directions of action because we have Jesus at our center. As we sing our closing song, I'll invite the praise team up. As we sing our closing song, and we sing of the love that we have for Jesus. I want to invite you to not just sing it as a song of affection or even a song of gratitude. Let it be a song of invitation for Jesus to enter your heart and to be the center of your life. Amen.